Um, dear participants, welcome to the second session of the Community of Democracies Youth Forum. We are glad to be joined by numerous youth networks, organizations, and young leaders from across the world today. Uh, the COD Youth Forum is organized under the leadership of the COD Presidency Romania that identified youth inclusion and empowerment as a priority for its presidency with the support of the secretariat of the community of democracy and today uh, uh my name is sue i'm from the asia democracy network and i will be your moderator for this session on this note i am honored to invite ambassador simona morella Nicolescu, representative of the u.n secretary general and head of the UN office in Belgium to develop to deliver the opening remarks. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sue. Uh, dear, much, much younger colleagues, um, it is quite a thrill to be with you today. Always when I address younger generation, I feel like getting ever younger. Um, and first of all, happy anniversary community of democracies. Uh, I would like to thank Secretary General Thomas Garrett and his team for organizing this um, forum during the mandate of the Romanian presidency of the community of democracies, of which, of course, I am very proud. And um, I'm also very grateful to my dear colleagues from the Romanian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, distinguished Foreign Minister Bogdan Aurescu and his team for inviting me. I miss you guys. Um, I'm really pleased to see that youth empowerment is one of the cross-cutting uh, themes mainstreamed into all activities uh, of the community of democracies and also a priority of the Romanian presidency. This is because for the organization that I've been serving, this was a top priority all along. That is why I'm really happy to be here this morning representing um, the United Nations, as you know, the only universal organization that has been striving for your rights, youth rights, since its inception, exactly 75 years ago that we celebrate this year. An organization that has a permanent focus on youth, on your rights, 
in many ways and formats. And that's because we believe in you as you demonstrate every day your clear power of change, transformational change, despite the problems that you also uh, are confronted with. Well, no wonder Thomas Edison said once uh, that uh, the greatest invention in the world is the mind of a child. We are really decided at the United Nations to take advantage of your energy, of your creativity, of your optimism, and especially we try harder to create favorable environments uh, for your ideas and action for creating together the future we want and you deserve. To paraphrase uh, my boss, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who loves and cares a lot about you, the younger generation, you inspire change. You have the talent, energy, and ideas, and ideals even, to prevent conflicts, defend human rights, secure peace, and realize the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. My dear friends, uh, we all know that the world is not in a good place. The COVID-19 pandemic confiscated our lives. People are divided. Hatred, inequality, violence, and xenophobia are on the rise. Climate change threatens our planet and future generations. I could go on and on and on. But what I want you to remember is that we truly believe in the power of solidarity, in building bridges across divides, taking on the big issues such as ending hunger, disease, exclusion, discrimination, pollution, inequality. And around the world, that is why the United Nations takes action absolutely every day. But it is not enough and we need to do more. At this time of ever more attacks on multilateralism and international cooperation, we know that our best hopes for global peace and prosperity on a healthy planet lie in the hands of you, young people. We need your leadership, we need your participation, we need your engagement right across the globe. That is why we have the first ever resolution on youth peace and security, uh, adopted by the UN Security Council in 2015 that uh, Foreign Minister also mentioned yesterday, and I was very glad to, uh, to hear that. Or, of course, the most recent one that, adopt, that was adopted uh, just a few days ago on the 14th of July. Um, as also the Minister said, they really emphasize uh, the importance of youth as agents of change in the preservation and promotion of peace and security and in building and maintaining peace, as well as the important role of the full, effective and meaningful participation of you, young people, in decision-making processes. Because we all the time say, uh, younger generation, the leaders of tomorrow. No, I always repeat, no, the younger generations is the leader of today. So we have to, to work with you work for you, listen to you, support you uh, all along the way. Also, that is why in September 2018, the Secretary General launched the United Nations Youth Strategy. I'm sure that you're aware, aware of it, Youth 2030, uh, a strategy that is led and it was actually compiled by, by a brave and hardworking uh, young woman, Jayatma, whom I hope you know already that is the UN Special Envoy for Youth. And she's working hard for you every day. And I truly hope that uh, you are cooperating with her and her team. The strategy, if you went uh, through it, seeks to make the UN a true leader in working with and for the younger gen uh, generation and in understanding their needs first in helping to put their ideas into action. And I think that Youth 2030 will uh, strengthen the United Nations' ability to support young people, especially their participation in society, their ability to secure employment, the realization of their rights and their role as agents of peace in very, very fragile contexts that we find all over the world. So I encourage you 
to join in uh, helping uh, the implementation of this strategy wherever you are. Dear younger friends, at this uh, pivotal moment, I could say, with COVID-19 still spreading and geopolitical tension rising and the cry for racial justice, social justice, climate justice, ever more urgent, we have a responsibility to respond to the anxieties, fears, and hopes of the people we serve. And we take this very seriously. And that is why we all the time say, and all our leaders all the time repeat, this is the moment for the international community to heed the current wake-up call and move ahead with a collective response in unity and solidarity. And we need you for this. We need you for spreading this message. The UN counts on you to be the architects of change and torch bearers that we need so much in our journey towards implementing the SDGs and achieving Agenda 2030. So let's make it happen. Please do not hesitate to, to learn, to explore, to dream, to discover, to innovate, to cooperate, to dare and break new ground if possible. So if you're ready for action, go for it and we will be supporting you all along the way because your destiny is in your hands. And don't forget what Alan Kay said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. So I think that um, we should all act together for the world we need and the world we want and we have to walk the talk together. The United Nations will always walk with you in solidarity and in dignity, because we love you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for those encouraging words. And I can't agree with you more about the need for solidarity, building bridges, especially during these difficult times and highlighting the importance of uh, youth participation and the empowerment of youth in the processes. Thank you so much. Um, as all of you uh, may well know, uh, in 2015, uh, the UN member states adopted a 15-year-old plan to end poverty, protect our planet, and improve the lives and prospects for everyone everywhere, which we call, as we have been mentioning, the 2030 Sustainable Development Goal Agenda. Today's panel will uh, discuss the significant role that youth can play in the implementation, monitoring, and review of the UN 2030 SDGs. And five, we have five young leaders here from different regions who will present their innovative initiatives aimed at achieving the SDGs worldwide, especially SDG 16, Peace, Justice, and Strong Institutions. The panel will also reflect on how governments, international organizations, civil society, private sector, and other stakeholders can help keep the focus on SDG implementation during the present COVID-19 crisis. We will start with the panelists' presentations, and then uh, we will, after the presentations, we'll go ahead and hear from the global youth, we'll hear their interventions, and then proceed with the Q&A. Please feel free to use the chat box um, on your screen to pose any questions you may have for the panelists. Without further ado, I would like to open the floor to our speakers, beginning with Lynn Rose, Jane D. Pienon. Lynn Rose is a member of the Executive Council of Young Women Leaders for Peace, a network of young women from the Philippines, and she is also a COD youth lead. Lynn Rose, the floor is yours. Thank you for having me. I am honored to be part of this panel today. I'll start with saying that the SDGs will shape our lives towards a better future, a world where everyone's rights are protected, respected, and upheld. That is the vision, and that is the future we all want, and that is the future that we all deserve. And this cannot be possible without us, the youth. I believe that achieving peace, justice, an inclusive society, along with strong functioning institutions in any country, 
can only be realized when everyone, including the youth, are meaningfully engaged. I am Lynn Rose Heno, and I am 25 years old, and I am from the Philippines. In the Philippines, I live in a community that is susceptible to experiencing different kinds of violent conflict. And I am aware that when young men and women live in such environment, they become more familiar to violence, conflict, and war than peace. And when youth experience violence, discrimination, and limited political inclusion, they can lose trust in the governance systems that are supposed to protect and support them. At the age of 13, I experienced the ugly reality of violent conflict, when our community in Lano del Norte was attacked because of the failure of the peace agreement. There were gunshots, some of my classmates were held hostage, houses were burned, and people were killed. And in 2017, nine years later, another violent conflict erupted not far from home, the Marawi siege, which displaced more than 350,000 individuals, including young women and men. Rebuilding the structures of the society, both physical and social, are still ongoing up until now. There are still families that are living in transitory sites. And the community is far from total recovery. And to make things worse, we are again confronted with another crisis, which is the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think while battling against the global health crisis, young people, I, I would like to believe, are not losing sight of the 2030 agenda. Having worked with young women in conflict-affected areas and post-conflict areas, I believe that SDG 16 needs to be the foundation for recovery effort, efforts and for rebuilding more resilient societies and institutions, emphasizing on the synergies between SDG 16 and the rest of the SDGs we have to recognize that without reduced inequality, violence, injustice, and corruption, it will be impossible to make necessary progress on different global agenda. For instance, in Sagunsuman transitory site, where some of the internally displaced persons of the Marawi siege still live. Poverty, population density, and displacement make fighting COVID difficult, if not impossible. Stay-at-home measures of the enhanced community quarantine in transitory sites make women, including young women and girls, as primary carers at home. And with the high level of, of stress brought about by this crisis, they become vulnerable to domestic violence. And this is, in fact, on top of the limited access to basic needs, such as food, clean water, medication, masks, including sanitary and hygiene products, because relief packages do not routinely include sanitary and, hy and hygiene kits for women and girls. So in our experience, we have seen young people are some of the most affected by the pandemic socioeconomic impacts. But despite the intersecting effects of this pandemic to young people, we I think it is important to highlight that youth are also among the most active in the COVID responses in the local and national level. In our network with the Young Women Leaders for Peace, which is a program of the Global Network of Women Peace Builders, our young women are at the front lines, volunteering in their delivering relief services, initiating fundraising activities, delivering hygiene kits to young women and girls, and even translating COVID prevention materials to different local languages to make information accessible to communities, especially with those with no internet access. So I think far from being mere beneficiaries of the 2030 agenda, I think it is, it is clear that young people have been active and are continuing to be engaged in the processes that support its implementation through working with the government, non-government organizations, and youth-led networks. And most of these efforts, especially from the local level, to this date remain unrecognized and amplified and receive little financial and technical support. So I think in order to have a just and humane society, we need to be serious in being inclusive in all our processes. In the context of COVID-19, this pandemic has reminded us that it is critical to recognize its impact on young people including young women, and to ensure that young people are meaningfully included in shaping responses and in deciding the new normal, from health to economy and security to social protection, particularly in conflict-affected areas and post-conflict areas where young women and men face the risk of being excluded from decision-making processes. And when I talk about inclusivity, I mean three things. First is ownership. We need to invest in educating the youth about the SDGs 
we need to work more in making every youth own the SDGs and not just see SDGs as a UN or global goals. Second is engage empowerment. We need to create more opportunities for young women and men to reinforce our agency. With more opportunities, we young women and men can reinforce our capacity to be co-creators of peaceful, just, and inclusive societies. And, and the third one is participation. Young people need a structured mechanism for participation through decision-making. All stakeholders need to work with youth organizations or groups of young people as partners, allowing young women and men to be in charge and be meaningfully included in the implementation and localization of SDGs. We need to give youth a wider space to affect systemic change. This crisis is a significant teachable moment for all of us as a global community. Of the ut utmost value of leaving no one behind, reaching the furthest left behind, and ensuring that the next generations will have a brighter future. Why wait for 2030 when we can start now? So let's make it happen now. Again, thank you very much for having me in this time. Thank you so much, Lynn Rose, for the fascinating, fascinating presentation. Great. We'll go uh, to our speaker. Um, I have next uh, Rosario Diaz Garavito. Uh, Rosario is the founder of the Millennials Movement that works to develop leadership skills of young people in Peru. Rosario is also a youth advocate for the UN SDG Action Plan. Action Plan. Rosario, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Is my microphone working? Awesome, thank you. Well, I first want to start my intervention um, thanking all of you and also the organizers for inviting me to this great panel. And also I feel very proud and excited because uh, I'm representing Latin America and the, and the Caribbean region and I think is I guess one of the first times someone from a region is here sharing with you so for me it's such a great honor to share with you what we have been doing. Um, whenever we talk about the 2030 Agenda uh, for Sustainable Development, the SDGs and young people and mostly what does it mean the SDG 16 for us. I, I really uh, agree on the previous words uh, uh, that, that were mentioned by the, the previous panelists. I think that when we talk about young people and SDG 16, we are not just we are we are thinking not only on participate or being consulted we are also thinking on how we can take part in this process. The 2030 Agenda made a global call for every single actor, young people, civil society, private sector, authorities, in order to work together on this plan to achieve sust the sustainable development goals. And definitely there is this question for us, and uh, uh, that is how we can be part, but also take part on this process. Definitely, whenever we think about this uh, sense of ownership, we also need to think about this sense of community, how we are going to work all together in order to achieve the sustainable development goals, but mostly, uh, or more than achieve the SDGs, how we are going to make sure that by 2030, the results of this achievement is reflected in the life of people is reflected in the life on how we on in our quality of life every single time we take a bus to go to school every single time we go to school and the quality of education is provided to the and to us over there every single time that we have access to health as uh, to basic health uh, services in our country so definitely i think the 2030 agenda gives young people, the younger generation, an opportunity to be part of, uh, of the future that we are envisioning together. Um, it's also important to mention that um, whenever uh, in the Latin American and the Caribbean region, whenever we think about the 2030 agenda, this opportunity multiplicates or triplicates in in like the impact is so big because we need to consider that my region 
is the most unequal region in the world. So the 2030 agenda gives us the opportunity also to reduce these gaps of inequality and that actually have been um, shown in a more vivid or explicit way with the pandemic of COVID-19. So definitely the 2030 agenda for us means not only the fact that we can participate, that we can engage, that we can build this future together, but also that we can reduce these inequalities that whenever there is a crisis, such as the crisis we are living now, definitely affects some, some people more than others. Um, one of the things I also wanted to mention is that when we think about young people and the implementation of the 2030 Agenda, we also need to think that young people is represented in every single sector in the society. You have young scientists, you have young people who are students, you have young artists, you have young, the young people is represented all across the society, young decision makers, young entrepreneurs. So definitely thinking about including a youth approach on this process is key to ensure that the, 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 the process to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is a sustainable process itself. So that is not going to cut at some point and then we are going to have to review or catch up somehow to keep working on the agenda, but how we start working the basis right now so the process is itself sustainable and by 2030 we can contribute everyone on our 100 percent and in this specific point i will call for the inclusion on young women and girls because definitely if imagine that let's let's make an example if if they told us, okay, you need to win the Formula Uno <laughs> or, or you know, this, this car match and you have a card and this is your card. With this card, you need to win this race. And what happens if they give you a card with only two wheels working and the other ones are flattened, you know? How are you expecting or how are we expecting to win this race if our card is has two flights that are not working, two flat tires. We need to be sure that this card has the four wheels working and those four wheels working are women and men, you know? And uh, because women are around the 50% of the world's population. So we need to build, we need to work in order to give young women and girls the opportunity to contribute their 100% in order to support the achievement of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development in their communities at the global level, at the regional level as well. From the Millennials Movement, that is, uh, is, um, is a youth leader organization based in Peru, we really think that it's possible for young people to take part in this process. We have been engaged on, on this uh, since 2013 with, with the post-2015 process, with the definition of the 2030 Agenda. We were advocating for the UN Millennium Campaign for the My World 15 survey. And we were a team of volunteers. We didn't have a budget because we are volunteers and it's a, it, the Millennials Movement started as a very, very small organization. But we have a lot of young people that were committed to this, that really believe on this vision. By the end of 2015, without a budget, we were able to engage 38,000 people in seven regions of Peru in the My World 2015 survey. These people were able to take their voices to decision makers or world leaders and also the UN to tell how they wanted to see the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And this was based on a volunteer strategy. This was based on a networking strategy, on knocking the door of like our local newspaper company and say, you know, you have in the materials in order to print these ballots because we want to include these other people who doesn't have the internet. You can put your logo, you can be your our partner to sensitize them in order to join us and then to take those paper ballots and go to, to little towns without internet and engage other people who were not able to engage. Since 2016 mm -hmm. until now, we have been working on an initiative called the 2030 Agenda um, Citizen Ambassadors Program. 
This is an initiative that also started in Peru, and now it's been expanded on 13 countries in the Latin American and Caribbean region, Spanish-speaking countries. What we do with this program, this is like a peer learning experience. Is and again, volunteering. We don't start with budget here. This is just like building on top of our dreams and then looking for allies and for organizations and for like governments and, and other young people that can help us to, to, to make this work. What we do with this program is basically we have six months, the first month, we train other young youth lead organizations based in, in, this, in this region on first, what is the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, but also some basic approaches on how they can contribute with, their impl with its implementation, from the importance of young civil society, gender equality, the reduction of inequalities. This is how we um, try to um, build or support the capacity building on other young people so they can also take the lead in their communities and engage in the process of achieving the 2030 agenda in their communities. After that, we have been um, working with different organizations. Now, this, this is the fifth edition to 2020, 2020, and we were able to partner with the UN system in Colombia and also the, the UN information system for Colombia, Ecuador, and Venezuela in order to engage young people not only on the activities on the, of the program, but also in the process of the UN 75th anniversary. So these are the things that we can work together, you know? I mean, whenever we build an alliance, let's bring, you know, our ideas, our capacity, our creativity, our capacity of mobilization as one of our biggest assets for these potential allies. So we can take action in the territories. The program also includes different kind of partnerships that allow young people to showcase what they are doing in, the, in their territories at the global level. So they feel part of something bigger and they feel empowered. They feel that whatever they are doing in this specific region in Guatemala is contributing to something huge around the world and that they are being part of that. Finally, um, it's important for young people to be engaged and also to follow up on the accountability processes on their communities. Sometimes um, our countries are taking decisions, our decision makers are taking decisions on how they are implementing the 2030 Agenda. And even sometimes they are taking decisions without considering the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So we need to be there to make sure that the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Declaration of Human Rights are being taken as a base in order to build our communities with these new policies. And mostly now with the COVID-19 response, we need the governments to focus and do not forget the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. A good practice for young people in order to build or to use, not to use, but to to do not stop their advocacy process on the for the 2030 agenda for sustainable development in this context of COVID-19 is to research information about your community. How are you doing? We have launched a campaign. And in this campaign, what we are doing are we are mixing three things. First, how is COVID-19 impacting young people in the Latin American and the Caribbean region? And how these impacts reflects in the different SDGs. And then we are making a call to young people to share the information and to ask their decision makers to don't leave us behind. So it's important, I think, for young people to, you know, engage, participate, not only engage ourselves, engage others, um, to also educate ourselves and take part on, on this process because we need to achieve these goals and we only have 10 more years. So that is the duty and that is our work that we need to do. So thank you very much. That will be my intervention. Thank you so much, Rosario, for that intervention. Okay, great. So we'll go ahead into our next speaker. I have Rafu Lawal, is the founder and executive director of Building Blocks for Peace Foundation, 
and organizations building the resilience of people promoting the Nigeria Youth for Peace Initiative, a movement of young people advocating and promoting peace in Nigeria. Rafu is also a COD Youth Week. I'll go ahead and hand over the mic to you. All right, um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, I am delighted to be given this opportunity to add my voice uh, to the global conversation on the role of youth in the achievement of uh, sustainable development goals. I'm also delighted again to listen to interesting and inspiring stories um, of my fellow youth leads. Um, it has been established that far from being mere beneficiaries um, of the sustainable development goals, uh, young people have also been active architects in the development um, and of course are uh, continuing to be engaged in frameworks and processes and now uh, driving the implementation and domestication of sustainable development goals at all levels, uh, be it local, be it national uh, and of course at the global level. Uh, with particular focus on SDG 16, it talks about peace, justice, and inclusive institutions. Young people are at the forefront of trying to achieve the various targets of SDG 16. Uh, within the context of where I work, Nigeria, uh, young people are also at the forefront of trying to ensure that there is peace and stability. Uh, young people are leading efforts and interventions aimed at reducing all forms of violence. and extremism through innovative approaches like peace education, um, social media messaging, um, games, capacity building, radio programming, uh, uh, etc. Um, in Nigeria, through um, Nigeria Youth for Peace Initiative, which is a movement of young people who are dissatisfied with the increasing rate of young people's uh, participation in criminality and violence, uh, we are now determined I mean, and of course mobilizing our, our peers um, and empowering them to be peace agents rather than I mean an instrument of violence that they used to uh, they used to be known for. Um, of course also Nigerian youth have also initiated a campaign um, known as follow the money campaign for those of us who are familiar with I mean, development in Nigeria they follow the money campaign an initiative by young people uh, youth volunteers are tracking uh, budget allocations and of course tracking uh, the spending on projects. This, this initiative, the whole idea behind this initiative is to ensure that, I mean, we reduce corruption. The whole idea behind this initiative is to ensure that we reduce mismanagement of funds, especially by public office holders, and ensuring that public funds are used uh, judicially and that people get, I mean, uh, dividends for, uh, for democracy. Aside from that, uh, I'm sure many of you are also familiar with the Not Too Young to Run movement, uh, which, I mean, started in Nigeria, which was basically attempts by young people uh, to remove the legal barriers that hinders their participation in decision making and political processes. Um, with, with, with the zeal and commitment of young people into the Not Too Young to Run movement, we were able to reduce the age requirement for elective positions um, in Nigeria. Uh, before now, for you to be eligible to contest for president, you must be 40 years and above. For you to be able to run for national assembly legislatures and state, state houses of assembly legislatures, you must be, I mean, 35 years and above, but we did not too young to run movement. We we're able to reduce that. Now you have uh, the age requirement for presidents to be 35. You have the age requirement for state houses of assembly and national assembly legislatures to now be 25. Now you have a lot of young persons who are occupying legislative um, offices across, across, across Nigeria. Of course, the numbers are still um, are very minimal when you compare with the available seats that are, avail uh, that, that are available in the country, we have about 1,000 seats available, and just about 120 of them um, are given to, or were won by young people. It was not given; it was it was won by it was won by young people. Another initiative that I want to quickly talk about or uh, cite is um, an initiative that is called Watching the Votes. Uh, Watching the Votes is, I mean. Um, an initiative that came out, out of the Not Too Young to Run uh, movement. And what we are doing with watching the vote in Nigeria is to monitor election proceedings, to monitor, monitor election process across board. With the Watching the Vote initiative, young people are ensuring that the will of the people, I mean, becomes the basis of government. We're ensuring that, I mean, elections are free and fair and transparent. And that, I mean, one man, one vote, that should be the order of the day. These are some of the examples of how young people are leading, I mean, the implementation of SDG 16 
um, in Nigeria. There are so many other examples, but time will not permit me to cite them. Um, despite these milestones, of course, you agree that um, there are several challenges hindering the participation of young people um, in peace building, for example, and by extension, the implementation of the SDGs, um, especially in Nigeria. I've heard my colleagues, I mean, talk about the structural issues. I mean, the question about Nigeria's, I mean, our poverty level. Um, in a report that was released by, by UNDP last year, I mean, the, the situation in Nigeria, the poverty level in situation in Nigeria was described as, as, as a multidimensional poverty. I mean, a majority of Nigerians live on $2 per day. And this is, this is a big factor if we are to, I mean, achieve uh, SDG 16 by 2030 in Nigeria. The question about unemployment, I mean, at the moment, about 30% of Nigeria's uh, population are unemployed. Uh, we, 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 with the current COVID-19 pandemic, young people are the most kids. Uh, the projection is that by the end of the year to 2021, unemployment rate in Nigeria will move from 35, will move from 30 to 35, uh, 40 there about. And this is this is this is a big a big factor. I mean, in the achievement of SDG 16, the question about infrastructural deficit. Of course, we know that government cannot do everything alone. They cannot do everything for us. Young people are ready and determined to also do something for themselves and for the country. But of course, what about infrastructural uh, conditions? I mean, with what is happening in Nigeria, the aspirations and desires of young people cannot be fulfilled under this kind of, under this kind of conditions. I mean, so it's important that we need to uh, begin to see how to address, how to address some of these things. Well, uh, the question about funding is a general problem. It's a global problem for youth-led organizations um, all across the world. Uh, in a report that was released by UNOY, the United Network of Young Peace Builders in 2000 and 2018, um, we discovered that I mean, one of the outcomes, one of the recommendations or re revelations rather from that report was that 49% of youth-led organizations operate on less than $10,000 annually. And you know, you know, you know what, what $10,000 can, can actually do. It, it's, it's, it's relatively low. It cannot do much. But that's just the reality of, of youth-led organizations and young people um, across, ac across the region, especially in Nigeria. The question of trust, uh, up till now, young people are still being demonized. Young people are still being securitized. When you ask for space, when you ask for, I mean, uh, I mean for them to, when you ask for access, I mean, people think that you want to, you want to, I mean, uh, you're contesting positions with them. You want to hijack position and, and so many things like that. I think we need to see how to address the issue of mistrust between government and young people. And of course, between young people and the other existing stakeholders. Uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, again, we have seen that the future of humanity is digital. And that is why it is important for us to embrace it. But of course, for those of us who are in, who are in West, West Africa, who are in Nigeria, uh, the question about the democratization of the digital space is, is still a big factor. Majority of young people in Nigeria still do not have access to internet. Even when the, I mean, even when it is available, what about the resources to ensure that these things are, I mean, are, are accessible? The question again about the security of the digital space is something that we need to also look into if we are to achieve, I mean, um, if we are to achieve peace in Nigeria. Terrorist organizations, uh, radicalized groups are taking advantage of the internet to brainwash young people. They are taking advantage of the internet, I mean, to mobilize people to coordinate the general, uh, general terrorist, uh, ter ter terrorist uh, activities. You, you, you all, I mean, if you follow international developments, every day in Nigeria you hear of the activities of Boko Haram, you hear of the activities of banditry. The Boko Haram, for example, take advantage of, of the internet. They go on internet to spread their to spread their uh, messages. They go on internet to, uh, to, to to mobilize people. This is something that we need to also look into. Young young people cannot do without the internet. We need the internet for education. We need the internet for capacity building. We need internet for for networking and collaboration. But of course, we need to ensure that I mean that space is particularly safe uh, for us. We are, we also I, I also want to point out the question about. Um, the shrinking civic space that we're facing in Nigeria at the moment. Government is making it difficult, I mean, for people to contribute their quota to sustainable development uh, and, and sustainable peace. It's, 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 it's very appalling that, I mean, the conditions are getting stricter every day. Young people cannot, I mean, uh, protest on the street peacefully anymore. If you try that, you're going to be arrested and you'll be locked up in jail. Uh, the rule of law is no longer being, being obeyed. These are issues that we need to also, I mean, critically look into if we are serious about achieving SDG 16, especially in Nigeria. Then lastly, I want to talk about lack of protection of youth peace builders. It's something that is also, uh, that is also critical um, at this point. Um, just, to, just to say that 
uh, to support young people adequately as agents of 2030 agenda, we must, number one, create an enabling environment for young people to engage. That is very fundamental. Without that, we are not going anywhere. Sustainable resourcing is very important. Finance, capacity building, technical guidance, these are things that I think that are essential if we want young people to truly function very well as agents uh, for the achievement of sustainable development goals. Of course, we need to also transform the structural exclusions uh, that surrounds um, young people. The question about sus sustainable jobs, um, education, quality education, protection of the right of young people. Then, of course, this is uh, peculiar to our own situation in Nigeria and in West Africa. Uh, many of our countries lack identity database, and it, 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 it's a major challenge for security of life. It's a major challenge for peace. It's a major challenge for sustainable development. Because when you don't have a national database, it becomes very difficult for you to plan. It becomes very difficult for you to assess. It becomes very difficult even for you to secure to secure your, your territory. So these are some of the issues that I think that uh, we need to be we need to begin to address if we are uh, going to achieve sustainable development goals 16 in particular uh, so in conclusion I want to um, commend again the United Nations Security Council uh, for the adoption of the three brilliant and interesting resolutions on youth peace and security especially with the newest one that was added to it UN Security Council resolution 2535 which gives I mean the needed um, international framework for us to continue to do our work. Our young people have been taking advantage of all these resolutions. We are using it to open space for ourselves. Uh, we are we, we're using it to, I mean, uh, ensure that we get what we truly deserve. In, 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 I mean, in ensuring that SDG 16 uh, is achieved. I want to. I also want to thank the Committee of Democracies, especially the Romanian Presidency, uh, for giving us this opportunity to amplify young people's voices, and of course for showing that. Uh, uh, sincerity in investing in youth empowerment uh, and recognizing that young people remain the building blocks upon which uh, democracy will continue to thrive uh, uh, and be sustained. So once again, I, I want to thank you for this privilege. I, I do not take it for granted. Thank you so much for being <laughs> Our next speaker, um, our next speaker is Esma, and she is from, uh, she's Georgia's youth representative to the United Nations. Esma is a co-founder of Disabled Women's Initiative Group, the platform for new opportunities and a host of the online radio show, Beyond the Horizon, on the radio, my voice of the helping hand. Esma, I'll give the floor to you. Mm. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, apologies for the technical inconveniences. I'm, uh, I'm joining you uh, now from the Youth Agency, uh, which was established in 2019, so last year, and which coordinates the uh, UN Youth Delegate Program in Georgia. Um, dear audience, it's a great opportunity for me to speak uh, to you at the first Youth Forum of Community of Democracies on behalf of Georgian youth. Um, the UN Youth Delegate Program has been established in Georgia since 2012. I'm the eighth youth delegate of, uh, of Georgia. We had four men and four women, including uh, persons belonging to an ethnic minority groups and persons with disabilities, uh, meaning myself in this case. Um, since 1980s, the UN encourages uh, member states to include their uh, young representatives into the delegations which on the one hand would enable um, people who live actually on the field in their own countries who have a lot of uh, uh, experience with their peers to bring new ideas and new discourse to the UN. And on the other hand, these people, these youth delegates would be able to uh, to uh, share the UN processes and information about them uh, with their populations uh, in an accessible language upon their return uh, to their countries. Uh, Every year, um, we have increased amount of countries that have UN Youth Delegates, which once again shows that um, uh, the international community gets and becomes more inclusive of uh, previously vulnerable groups and thus more democratic. Uh, from the EU Eastern Partner countries, which are six, only Georgia and Ukraine has currently uh, UN Youth Delegate programs. Um, so throughout this year, I have uh, I have met over a thousand uh, young persons, both in Tbilisi and in the regions of Georgia, um, school students, uh, university students, 
young professionals and also needs, so persons uh, not in education, uh, employment or training. Um, and then also, of course, uh, I met some of them online after the pandemic started. Um, I, I'll always try to talk to them about the UN SDGs, uh, but also spread information about EU, US and other international actors funded youth opportunities, exchange programs, uh, volunteer possibilities, um, grant opportunities. Uh, but most importantly, ask them what do they think about sustainable development and what issues do they see around them and how maybe they are solving them already or how do they see them to be solved. And then I try always to share this information at different interviews with the decision makers and at this in the high level platforms such as this, for instance. Um, as the UN has uh, prioritized in its work uh, four SDGs for Georgia. Uh, I will now name them and then I will discuss what I have found from the young people I've been meeting uh, uh, about and over these four uh, SDGs in particular. So first is SDG 5 on gender equality. The second is uh, SDG 10 on equality among persons and the states. Um, then it's SDG 16 on peace and sustainable institutions and uh, SDG 17 on public-private par partnership. So we'll start with, with the goal five. Um, due to the isolation rules, uh, young women and girls living in the conservative families uh, face additional um, barriers as now they have to, uh, as all the learning and work happens online, now they have to really be explaining to their families why do they have to, uh, for example, go out if they, is they don't have to go for studies or work. So they have to really justify this. For the goal 10, which is uh, equality among persons and states, uh, we still have the situation. I actually sometimes individually consult uh, uh, young people who reach out to me um, and try to connect uh, them with decision makers. Um, and through these uh, communications, I found out that some youngsters with disabilities still have a difficulty uh, to pass university entrance exams in accessible formats for them. Um, also, the, the young students living in occupied and coming from occupied territories I had difficulty during the pandemic as they were locked up and were not able to come uh, return back to their homes or receive the support from their parents because the parents were also locked uh, up behind the Russian occupation line. Um, also in terms of uh, web accessibility, as I said, I'm, for example, joining you from the youth agency because uh, WebEx, unfortunately, is not a blind friendly platform. Therefore, I cannot navigate it independently and have to rely on others in, in relation to that. Um, with regards to um, also some young people had to uh, be overexposed to the COVID threats. Um, those who were working in the service sector, those who were, uh, for instance, locked up in the in the market, in the supermarkets, so that they could start the work right away after the curfew ends in the morning, for instance. Um, on the goal um, regarding the equality between states, uh, when we were discussing with my peers, uh, many of them talked about the importance of solidarity between um, middle, middle-sized, and little and smaller states, uh, to ensure and that our our territorial integrity, our sovereignty is not torn apart, and that we don't face separatism, occupation, and um, hatred and conflict, no matter who our allies are internationally. Um, on the goal 16, I always talk about this. It's very important to um, talk not only about resolving big inter-ethnic or political conflicts, but it's for, it starts from our communities. How do we treat each other internally? Is there bullying? Is there tolerance? Is there acceptance and solidarity? Uh, with regards to that, I would say that uh, the solidarity that our civil society showed in, in 2018 um, when uh, Pankisi Gorge resident who is ethnically kissed or Chechen, um, was um, fatally shot uh, in creating the social demand for proper investigation of that case was really worth noting because, as I said, the, the Georgian civil society really showed solidarity to his family in, in that regard. 
Uh, I'm a member of the um, youth initiative group, which is called the 16th Element, and where we publish blogs and some interviews, but also hold discussions with young people around Georgia about peace and conflict and try to uh, put forward peace narratives from our personal lives and our personal peace experiences. Um, with the goal 17, a lot of um, young people mentioned the importance of, of socially responsible business. As for business, it's also very important to, um, to live in, uh, operate in prospering and stable society uh, because this prosperity and economic stability and political stability, peace, and all other um, relevant um, human rights uh, really contribute to the uh, to creating more demand, like more economic demand on the goods and services that they provide. And one of the things that was um, put forward by the young people uh, was vision that um, it's important that food that remains in the restaurants or hotels unused is given out to those who really need it instead of being uh, thrown away. Of course, there are much more uh, issues that I would like to speak, but as time is limited, I would stop here and would be uh, always glad to answer your questions um, if you have any. Thank you. Thank you so much, Esma, for your intervention. We will now go uh, to our last but not least speaker. Uh, we'll go to Salamatu Fati. Uh, Salamatu is the founder of a charity-based foundation called Salamatu Foundation for Education, advocating and promoting human rights, most especially in respect to access to quality education and realization of gender equality. Salamatu is also a COD leader. Are you seeing? Salamatu, I'll give you the floor. Um, good morning from the Gambia. Um, I don't know if you guys can hear me, but good morning from the Gambia, by the way. It's really quite early here. Um, so thank you so much to all the speakers, that, I mean, the, all the panelists, the speakers were really amazing. And good morning to the Excellency and to all my fellow panelists as well. This is Salim from the from the Gambia. Um, I'm, I'm actually more particular about SDG 4 and, and SDG 5, and that's because of the personal reason that I went through and also the personal reason of my family. That is because I'm, I'm actually from economic disadvantaged family and having access to quality education was, was a very, very difficult situation for us. And at a younger age, I nearly dropped out of school. Um, my mother was was a victim of forced marriage as well and i lost my dad when i was really early so she was the only one that i know so actually based on the perception of people i mean perception of the uh, my country people regarding uh, gender role when it's come to women is that they cannot do a lot of work for themselves they cannot do a lot of things without men in their behind but this is a different story in the case of my mom because she was alone she raised like a nine student alone without no father in it so this really, really inspired me a lot um, to advocate more on the SDG 5, that is the um, gender equality part, for people to see the other um, side of the story, for people to see what else women can do, not only to uh, be at the back of the men. So I will, I will try to do advocacy in, in the aspect of trying to change this narrative as well. And also using my personal um, stories to change and give courage to young, all the young people out there that they, they have to try by all means to have access to um, quality education and if they have the opportunities, let them not actually miss it out. Um, so I founded the Salimoti Foundation for Education in 2015. Um, the inspiration is all from uh, what I didn't explain earlier about regarding my personal life story and the personal life story of my mom as well. So the foundation actually um, is mainly focusing on human rights advocacy, but specifically focusing on access to quality education and, and gender equality as well. So we have done numerous activities in to make sure that we realize the change that we are yearning for. Uh, one, of, one of the things that we do, because we try to study the environment first, what young people do they really need, what, what their level of awareness, what kind of programs can we actually bring. Um, in trying to promote um, the agenda 
2030 and all the AU agendas and all the other all all agendas. We first of all trying to create their level of awareness, how well they know about these agendas, then first before putting them into it. Because we believe that in empowering people, we have to make sure they are aware of the issues they, that they are going to be empowered about and uh, what issues, what the kind of issues can be effective to their development and as well as to their life. So this is uh, very crucial, I mean, important to us. So this is what we try to do. Um, so at the foundation level, we, we actually engage the Minister of Basic and Secondary Education in my country to make sure um, they provide policies that, you, that it's going to be available for both rich and the poor people to benefit from it. And this is in the angle of uh, some of the policies that are there. Actually, it's more of that it's meant for rich people because the poor cannot really attend or have access to quality education because of the policies in place, because of how, how rigid it, the policies are. So we try to make sure that we have um, a flexible policy that you know is actually good for both the poor people and the um, rich people as well. So we run um, a teen girls mentorship program. This program actually is more like really inspiring me a lot for the fact that we gather young people and exposing them to different and various um, careers. We expose them for them to um, have the zeal and also not to feel limited in, in um, approaching their dreams. So what we do at the Tingas Mentorship Program, we, we mentor them, we make sure that they, they try to actually, um, we, we have to be, we try to, for them to actually realize, I mean, do self-realization. So we try, we invite politicians, especially young politicians, because this is not very common in the Gambia. Many politics, many people, the way they see politics is like when you get to your forties, that that's the right time for you to get uh, for you to involve in politics. And because of this mindset, so many young people see policy politics as an old people job. It's not meant for young people. It's like young people are supposed to be there just to be engaging in the advocacy level. Uh, <coughs> sorry, in the advocacy level, in to make sure that politicians do what's right. But in order for young people to actually involve themselves to make sure they create that they create that a conducive environment and the policies environment, because of the way politics is actually defined and the way it is seen in my country, young people do not tend to go for it. So we at the mentorship um, session we try to change this narrative. We have to make sure that we invite young politicians um, to share their stories, what really inspire them, and the benefit the opportunity, the challenges involved, and why it is really important for young people to engage in the politics. And because of this, um, we have a lot of our young people now that, also, that they now see politics differently, and they are really, really eager to involve themselves into, into the politics, and they also try to engage themselves in the national discussion as well. And these are these were issues that you know they were seen as a taboo. It's more of like it's still up to people that are really, really higher there, but it's not meant for young people. So we are so glad that the mentees have gone far to push their I mean to reach their limit or even to push it forward to make sure that their voices are heard, to make sure politics narrative is actually changed in the Gambia. Um, so we, we, uh, the foundation is also a member of the United Nations Girls Education Initiative, ANGAI. Um, so we, we are part of the advisory committee, the Youth Advisory Committee, and we try to look at youth en engagement from different perspectives and how to uh, contextualize it to make sure that youth voices are heard, to make sure that um, young people needs are met in order for them to engage in certain kind of activities and also where their benefits are. So um, at Angai level as, as well, uh, we've been doing quite a lot of advocacy in involving young people, especially in the side of um, gender, gender perspective as well. So in my opinion, I think um, young people are supposed to be at the center stage of every discussion, every forum, every decision-making organ. Um, I think it, it is actually time for us to change the narrative everywhere. It is time for young, not to only advocate for young people to participate in politics, but to make sure they participate meaningfully, 
to make sure that they are given uh, I mean, opportunities and avenues whereby they can be the decision-making organ, not only to be behind. Because this is the thing, we can advocate for young people in the politics. Young people can engage in politics, but if they enter in politics, how is their meaningful, how is their uh, meaningful engagement? Because entering into the quality, advocating for young people to space in quality is key, is one thing. But also their meaningful participation is another thing. So I think um, it, uh, we have to, in as much as we are doing advocacy in trying to promote young people participation in politics, we shouldn't relent or we shouldn't forget about their meaningful development into the politics as well. Because this is, this is very, 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 very crucial. Like currently Gambia, we are having a lot of young people that are having the zeal and the courage to join um, political parties. But that is just the basic of joining. But when it's come to parliamentary voting, a lot of young people are resistant to go for it because there's things like if they couldn't win that political position, their future career is actually destroyed. And because of it, they don't really um, tend to go far with the politics. So I think it's very, very essential for us to uh, do that. And also, um, the ideas of young people in the political spaces need to be respected, need to be promoted. We shouldn't um, actually relent, uh, relent on that. We should not only look at the participation side, but let's think about, let's take, um, take issues of young people, their ideas, what can, what can they offer at the table? We have to listen to young people. I think it's, um, it's actually the right time now. And also promotion of young people's work um, in that regard. Because in as much as we are trying to change um, people's life in as, well, in as much as we are trying to promote youth participation in politics. Let's not forget that young people, are, they can be so quick in, in, in fall into mental health issues because of the environment surrounding them. And this is one of the key things that I'm actually particular about because I have realized that most of the time we try to deprive, I mean, put our advocacy in putting people in forward, but we don't actually think about their mental health stages. Will they be actually be enough okay for this kind of state? What kind of condition are they in right now? We don't really consider this. So I think it's very, very essential we, we consider is like yesterday from the one of the panel that I was so inspired by is we have to provide good education to people if we want them there in their political participation. And that is so true. And as much as we want people to join in political, uh, to, um, political participation, let's not forget about giving them the good quality education. Because if young people do not have the good quality education, even they come into the political spaces, they wouldn't do much. They cannot do much because they lack the education. So I think, um, it's, it's, it's actually just like the SDG system. It's more of like everything is connected, by the way. All the SDGs are interlinked. They are connected. You cannot do one aside of the other one. You can be actually passionate about uh, I mean, a, particular, um, a particular SDG, but it's, they are all interlinked because SDG system, if you look at the SDG system, the promotion of the peace and inclusive society for all. And this Actually, it's um, to me, it's actually looking at the. It, I mean, this SDG does not let anyone out. It does not matter if you are a differently able person, it does not matter where you are from. It's that everyone is actually involved. It does not matter whether you're a woman or, or you are a girl. So it's more of like the umbrella, but it's for, for all these SDGs as well. Um, so I think another thing is so that we have to focus is more um, to create awareness about, uh, about the UN Sustainable Development. Because, I mean, if you are in the advocacy field, it's easy for you to get aware about all these acts and all these, um, um, the, the, all these acts and all these sustainable development goals. But young people that do not have the opportunities to, to such platform would not be actually be aware about this kind of issue. So during the mentorship program, we went to UN House in the Gambia. Um, so they presented about the SDG, uh, the, the SDGs, and it was so surprising that many young people do not even understand this SDG, do not even know what what is it all about. So I think a lot of awareness raising is supposed to be raised in that about what SDGs is all about because we can be talking about SDGs, SDG. Many, I mean, the name is familiar, but what does the SDG stand for? What is the role of the young people in achieving that SDGs? What meaningful development can they play? These all are crucial issues surrounding 
the creating awareness about um, young people participation in, in all phases actually. Um, so in my opinion, I think young people can be more meaningfully engaged in the NGOs. And the reason is that I'm, uh, I'm going to contextualize this because in my country, I don't know if this applies to other countries as well, but if you are working for the government, you are mute. You cannot say other things. You are okay with everything that the government does. You cannot say something against the government. So young people cannot be in that space. They cannot, they cannot be in a state whereby they have been controlled. They cannot raise, or raise their concerns about issues that are not promoting democracy. So for young people to engage meaningfully in all spaces, it has to be at the NGO level, whereby the freedom or their freedom of speech is guaranteed. They are free to say, I mean, what everything in regarding in promoting democracy, in achieving peaceful environment and all of that, even with have been sad. You have the opportunity to talk with even with have been sad. So I think um, is the is is actually the most important aspect for young people to share their ideas, to share about issues issues to do. But and I also think um, community of democracy because I see they're having like a lot of um, government um, as a member in the community of democracy. I think as COGs, one of the one of the things also that we have to look surrounding it's about how community of democracy can engage government in the meaningful of achieving democracy space and whereby the opportunity will be given to young people, even working in the government, to talk about democracy issues, to talk about issues affecting them, not only to mute when they go outside of the government to talk about it, but how can their right uh, of speech, how can their work be safe if they go to that cloud, if they go out to talk about issues affecting young people or issues affect, even affecting the democracy or, um, I mean, of the nation. We, we have to make sure we, let's not forget about that because the, it's like the advocacy is focusing on, only on the NGO workers, actually, and we have some young people that are passionate about all the issues, you know, in the organ of the government, and that's the only space that they can work in. So we have to, prov we have to make sure we, we advocate and give out that space whereby young people will be able to raise their voices even in the government, even they are working at the government level, not just um, at, the, at the NGO level. So that is all for me. Um, I don't know if you guys here because it's early in the morning here, actually. So thank you, everyone. It's, it was my pleasure, actually. Thank you, Salawatu. And thank you, everyone, for your impressive and inspiring uh, presentations. Um, I, I don't think I'm, I speak for everyone. I have been, it's been empowering just to listen to all of your uh, experiences and what you're working on to achieve the SDGs. So before moving on to the Q&A se uh, session, we will have our global youth interventions from our COD youth leads. Um, and for those of you who are attending online, please do not hesitate while you listen from the youth leads to uh, pose any questions you may have for the speakers. So the COD youth leads are young activists and democracy leaders from different countries and world regions, from Canada to Estonia, from Nepal to Haiti, who are part of community of, of the community COD youth lead social media campaign uh, aimed at sharing engaging and inspiring stories of youth and their contributions toward defending, promoting, and strengthening democracy. So we have uh, six youth lead speakers to give their two-minute interventions. Um, I'll go ahead and name you one uh, by one, and then you can go ahead and make your interventions. So the first um, youth lead, we have uh, Monica Iloska Pintardioska from North Macedonia. Thank you. Uh, it is a pleasure to open the Youth Voices part. And it is really uh, glimmering and inspiring that youth empowerment is in the focus not only of the Romanian presidency of a community of democracy, but also of its uh, UN priority as well through the Youth 2030 Agenda. 
promoting and supporting youth empowerment for sustainable development and peace in line with recognition of young people as positive and critical agents of change is our task of today. When I say our task, not only of young people, but also of us as part of NGOs, uh, of us as part of decision makers, uh, as part of institutions. I was lucky enough to discover the power of civic education back then when the same, in the same time when the Warsaw Declaration was adopted. When I was unfolding the human rights to the essence of equality, non-discrimination and fairness, I found myself and my personal long-term goal to help young people to know and to employ their rights, their freedoms and the values of democracy. I'm lucky enough that I'm in a position of a program manager at the Coalition of Youth Organizations, SEGA. I'm glad to say that I'm constantly contributing in this, my, uh, this personal goal of mine. Our numerous analysis and policy papers just confirm the importance of young people's inclusive engagement, participation, and advocacy, not only in the SDG integration, but as well in their implementation, monitoring, and accountability. As a national network of youth organization, we strive towards improving the quality of education, both non-formal and formal education, that will be inclusive and will offer lifelong learning opportunities to all. Um, we are focusing mainly on the uh, SDG 4, 8, and 16, and I'm going to refer my further discussion to this. The COVID crisis further diminished the quality of education, also further diminished the already low standard of young people, not only in our country, but I in the countries in general uh, in the same level as North Macedonia. Um, we all need to adapt to these uh, current challenges. There is need of immediate intervention in innovation and modernization of education. Education has suffered the most. Also, employability and low standard of young people is a matter of discussion as well. Following the current challenges, SEGA has introduced innovative approach in employability enhancement and career counseling processes with young people at risk, young people in this situation through employing digital technologies. We all need to use, uh, to adapt to these new technologies and to follow the innovation progress. Even in situation of COVID, we are constantly supporting undereducated Roma population to increase their chances for employment for a decent job. I'm just emphasizing this, that it is possible to work in this period of time, especially for young activists and young people in youth NGOs. Among other programs, more than nine years, we strengthen the critical thinking ability of young people as well diplomacy skills through simulating the model United Nations in which young people have the leading role at any level. Building youth capacities and leaders for democracy in the primary and secondary education in the past 10 years through supporting child participation models in schools, we created a pool of powerful young leaders of today on whom we can count on. And yes, we, the young people, bring innovation and change. And yes, young people can be equal partner for development and sustainability. And yes, now is the moment to give the floor to young people to lead the sustainable development debate. Thank you, and I'll pass the floor to my peers. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. We'll now next go to Samuel Asante from HANA. Thank you very much, Sue. Um, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. First of all, I'd like to thank COD for and the Romanian presidency for this opportunity to speak out. And I'd like to start by stating this economic sustainability can be transformed into a social or political power. And one of the key things facing youth globally is youth poverty. And the question here is how are we able to engage the youth more in the SDG? Um, projects or programs in general. And I'd like to start by stating some, um, some positive examples from my country, Ghana. We have example, um, a gentleman by name, John Arma, 
And John Allman is much focused on bridging the investment gap between young entrepreneurs with investors. And under his leadership, he has been able to train a lot of young entrepreneurs in the country, and he's one of the young advocates for youth entrepreneurship in the country. And this one, one too, is Regina Honu. And she is um, the founder of Soronko Academy, and she's much focused on girls in IT. So the concept here is, how do we engage um, our female sisters or brothers, or um, sorry, female sisters to get engaged in STEM education? And these are some of the processes that she pushed across to go across the country to engage their female, um, um, our female counterparts into this time. And we also have a gentleman by the name Prince Agatha. Now, Prince is focused on creating um, economic sustainability as well as protecting the environment under his um, company called Colva Ghana. What they do is they are engaging their community to gather plastic waste and they are being paid for those plastic waste and these plastic waste are being recycled into other projects or other, other products in general, in general. And then we have a, a lady by name Fadila Ahmad, who she's an amazing young woman who is trying to engage the, the young Ghanaians or other African um, young people into remote working. Okay, so what's the, what's the concept behind all this? The idea is that, like, like Simona said, the best way to envision the future is to create it. And for us to be able, as young people, to have a political say or a strong, um, let's say, impact on the community, we have to be economically sustainable. We have to create all these avenues for ourselves to be economically sustainable in there. Now, how do we also push ourselves to engage the SDG in the political section? That's why we have um, NGOs or civil societies like Imani Ghana that are trying to use um, intelligent young people to, to, to be, as let's say, a watchguard on government budget and how budget is being allocated across, across the country. Now, this is a very key aspect of, the, of, of policies that we feel to actually appreciate because without watching where the money is going, you'll not be able to track how much is being given to the youth development in the country. And this is very key on how we can be able to project youth empowerment in the attempts of the SDGs. We also have organizations like, uh, let's say, um, Occupy Ghana, that is trying to push the, the, um, um, the, the scope of protesting on the streets and trying to bring the government into accountability to ensure that what, whatever they do is in the interest of the people. And a chunk of the Occupy members are all young people, just like you and I. And that shows how the political scene in Ghana has grown and developed and has been become very healthy for youth engagement in, into this sector. And now, the question is, what is the way forward? How can we how can we empower the young people for them to actually do more to enhance the SDGs? The first thing I can always mention is PPP, that is private public partnership. We are strong people, we have the ideas, we have the energy, we have the passion, we have all the abilities to do the work we can do, but we do not have the financing. This is a very key aspect in there. Thankfully, my country, Ghana, has free education from kindergarten all the way to high school. So we do have a structure in place to educate our citizens and the young people. But the question here is, after, apart from we giving you the education, are you being given the tools that can enhance you to imp implement this education you've given to impact the economy of the country and the people in the country? So financing is a very key aspect that we need to also focus on. And an example can be creation of hubs across the country, so across the regions. Okay, like let's say entrepreneurship hubs, whereby young people can use the synergical energy in there to, to bring across the, the power to work together, to create uh, program, programs and, and, and projects that can help enhance the society in general. And as, as Alonso said, the SDGs are all intertwined together. So to be able to have young people economically engage Will be able to also push us into the political front for us to have meaningful engagement with the politicians, with the people in the communities. And at the end of the day, you see that was young people are actually taking the helm of leadership in the country and in the world in general. So I think for young people to be in the SDG effectively, yes, we are doing all the speaking, we are doing all the protests, we are doing all the you know calling for governmental accountability, but we need the actual physical power, and that is economic power. Because yet again, without economic power, we are nothing. We are just a tool in the hands of the politicians to use. And this one example that I say plays a big effect on hindering youth participation in politics. Just as my, uh, my fellow colleague from Nigeria made mention, which is true. Youth poverty in Africa is a very serious and dire issue. And this is why politicians take advantage of us to use us as their foot soldiers to do all sorts of crazy things on the streets or out there in politics. 
So imagine having a world where the young people are financially capable and sustainable to engage meaningfully in the community. Imagine such a world. Now, that is the world that I'm aiming for, and that's what I'm calling COD um, um, member states to also envision, to ensure that what they give the power to the young people by creating the enabling environment for us to push forward. So thank you very much for this platform, and I give the floor to my fellow colleagues to give in their intervention, and I wish you the best. Thank you, Samuel. Next, we'll go to Ioana from uh, Dostoevsky from Romania. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It, was, it is so inspiring to hear so many impactful stories at this early in Romania, at least at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, my name is Ioana, and I'm a fellow uh, COD Youth Lead. I'm also the president of UNIT Romania, so I represent the youth of Romania in terms of promoting UN values uh, nationally. Um, what um, I prepared to tell you today is not as uh, inspiring, it's um, not as deeming as, uh, as what uh, my fellow colleagues uh, have told you. Um, we at the UNIT Romania uh, focused uh, our, our work on uh, SDG number four, mostly quality education. And uh, recently on SDG number 13 uh, regarding climate action. Um, since the implementation of Agenda 2030, uh, the numbers uh, regarding uh, people who are still experiencing uh, poor education and unemployment um, uh, outcomes are still high. Um, I believe that Rome wasn't built in a day, but there should be a start somewhere because right now, at, um, as I mentioned yesterday, at a whole population of 7 billion and a half people, uh, people uh, that are young account for 1.8 billion, and 90% of that 1.8 billion live in developing countries. And at this point in education, about 142 million um, youth of upper secondary age are out of school, uh, which I believe is not the case of the persons here today present in this panel. And also, upper secondary enrollment rates average only 14% uh, in low income countries. Also, almost 30% of the poorest 12 to 14 year olds have never attended school so far. So, inequalities in access are reinforced in uh, different countries by discrimination and violence, often directed to the single group. Uh, this case, uh, this is also the case of Romania, where, where um, the rate of school dropout has reached last year 25%. Um, moreover, according to the UN World uh, Youth Report uh, regarding the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs, in 2018, there were 71 million young people that were unemployed and many millions more in precarious or informal work. Many youth face similar challenges. 50% of Romanian youth uh, or uh, needs, as um, it is the term, um, are unemployed and have not been given the opportunity to follow a certain educational program that allows them to learn a trade. Um, the challenges of securing and retaining decent work are even more serious and complex for vulnerable and mar marginalized youth, young women, those living in humanitarian settings, youth with disabilities, the LGBTQ community, which is a problem here in Romania with them, um, they are more and more uh, discriminated, and they don't have the same advantages as um, other young people have. While at this, um, only certain entrepreneurs offer solutions, but a certain strategy needs to be implemented. Um, governments uh, tend to overlook youth when addressing their strategies, um, and in the long run, that is not uh, that is not uh, good for young people. I'm certain that. In the long run, the international community will play an essential role in providing overall leadership by bringing stakeholders together, by attracting international financial aid. But at the moment, the boots on the ground are those of young people working in the civil society sector, in NGOs, actively volunteering in order to bring a different perspective and change the future of their peers. Um, I believe that everyone can agree that um, critical to the success of the 20, uh, 2030 agenda um, is the role of young people, of our role more exactly, in engaging with local and national governments and delivering policies um, um, 
attending different programs and working on the ground. Thankfully, in Romania, the government of Romania has developed a Department of Sustainable Development, department which is in charge of implementing the 2030 Agenda by working with youth and the civil society sector. The site is definitely shy, but at least there is one. Um, in the future, in terms of educating youth on the 2030 Agenda, we at the Unit Association of Romania, we plan on um, bringing solutions that are more and more um, attractive to younger generations uh, by entertaining them with podcasts, um, having regional hubs where they can go and uh, find out more about the SDGs and not only and also to have an objective, uh, objective and authentic experience. We plan to partner with similar NGOs. And um, as I said, with the boots on the ground, travel nationally in different areas, mostly rural areas of Romania, because that's where uh, the, the rates of the school dropouts are the highest, in order to get to speak with different uh, sectors of youth, different categories of youth, and see where the problem lays and uh, find uh, certain solutions. Thank you. Thank you so much for your intervention. We'll now go to Reyes Chernik from South Africa. Thank you. Good morning, Secretary General Thomas Garrett, Your Excellency Ambassador Mikalescu, dear panelists. For many African states, poverty, political instability, and environment degradation are formidable challenges to meeting the 17 global goals in just 10 years. However, there is an opportunity for African states to reach these goals if African youth are well informed and fully involved in the development program. Africa is the continent with the youngest demographics in the world, with 80% of its population under the age of 24. Young Africans are an incredible resource towards achieving all SDGs. With 10 years left paving the way forward, Africa should develop a roadmap that focuses on three intertwining fundamental SDGs that are pivotal to the complete realization of the development goals. These are SDG 4, quality education, SDG 8, decent work and economic growth, and SDG 9, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. SDG 4 is the foundation that results in the youth being active world citizens that are able to understand and engage local, regional, and global issues effectively. Quality education empowers the youth, provides human capital, and improves the literacy rate, aiding the accomplishment of all subsequent SDGs. Once the youth have benefited from quality education, they have to be further empowered by being provided with opportunities to obtain decent work, SDG 8. But it is, is in the public, whether it be in the public or private sector. The, the, this will result in the rise of small to medium enterprises. Bearing that in mind, this will see the rise in GDP, further resulting in economic growth, thus combating Africa's poverty crisis by directly dealing with the economic inequality. To achieve booming industry, innovation, and infrastructure, SDG 9, a state needs economic growth, which is achieved with the realization of SDG 8. Innovation predominantly relies on the creativity of informed youth, which is generated from SDG 4. The, the development of sustainable infrastructure relied on educated youth and economic growth signifies the codependency of these three SDGs. By the implementation of this roadmap, it will ensure that no one is left behind and that all SDGs are accounted for and achieved. The youth must therefore ensure that their leaders as duty bearers uh, place them at the table that are able to make critical decisions. It is therefore crucial that youth mobilize themselves to engage with their leaders and mutually decide on appropriate strategies to benefit the youth and subsequently the continent. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll now go to Tina Tim Oblad from Georgia. Good morning, distinguished members of the panel, excellencies, respected colleagues. 
I'm Tinatin Oboleta from Georgia, one of the COD youth leads. First of all, thank you for your insightful speeches and for bringing interesting topics. Today, during our forum, more than 100 armed conflicts are taking place around the world. And one of the conflicts is just 14 miles away from me. In my own country, 20% of territories are occupied by Russian Federation. Georgian youth face inevitable threats to their peace and security every day. And once living in conflict zones, they mass human rights violations. To that reason, we need to implement SDG 16 effectively. We should promote the idea of accountability and justice for all the victims of armed conflict. Develop and implement effective mechanisms to document and follow up cases on human rights violations against young people, including creating safe spaces where young people can report them and provide adequate financial resources to support youth organizations, movements, networks, initiatives focused on SDG 16. In the interest of justice and realization of the objective of SDG 16, I propose to use organizations around the world to empower the International Criminal Court to hold perpetrators responsible for the gravest crimes of concern to the international community, which made thousands of young people a victim. I will share the UN Secretary General's idea that it is time to halt hostilities and use the power of solidarity instead of the power of guns and take the momentum for ensuring peace and successfully fight our common enemy, the COVID-19 pandemic. We were asked to take bold actions as youth and let's start with voicing up for peace, security and justice for all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. We'll now go to Pippa McHugh from the United Kingdom. Kipa, are you on the line? Are you here? Mm -hmm. So I'll give Pippa a few minutes. I think um, she's having some technical uh, difficulties. Um, please intervene uh, anytime when you're ready. Um, in the meantime, uh, we are running a little bit behind schedule, but we do have uh, some questions uh, for the panelists. Oh, Pippa? Hello? Oh, yes, yeah, okay. thank you. Thank you. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, sorry, it's probably to do with the earpiece. Um, so thank you very much for, to the speakers for their interventions today. And thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, as established in the Sustainable Development Agenda for 2030, young people are a driving force for development. We cannot achieve the Sustainable Development Goals without engaging youth. And many youth are already highly engaged. They're recognizing problems in their societies they live in and finding solutions. Some have become household names for what they've achieved. This includes Greta and Malala, but perhaps less internationally known, and, uh, but important in the United Kingdom, there's Amico George, who led a campaign against period poverty in England. When she found out that 10% of women and girls in the UK could not afford sanitary products, and that this was leading young women to miss school and threatening their opportunity for an education, she successfully led a protest to petition the government to provide free sanitary products to all school-aged youth that needed them. This policy came into practice early this year, meaning that AMICA not only brought direct progress towards Goal 3 for health, but also Goal 5 for gender equality and Goal 4 for education. And this is not to disregard the achievements of all the young, other young people who have perhaps not got, garnered such high levels of attention. It was really encouraging and very prom promising for the achievement of the global goals, therefore, 
to hear that there are an increasing number of countries sending youth representatives to the UN. It's a demonstration that governments and organizations are recognizing the value added of young people. However, I think it's also um, important to uh, for governments and NGOs not to instrumentalize youth. Youth doesn't comprise a single homogenous category. Young people have different cross-cutting identities, different values, and different desires. They also face particular vulnerabilities because of their age. They, or we, are not simply a resource to be tapped, or alternatively, a threat to be dealt with. In this regard, I think there's a need to ensure that efforts to promote youth engagement don't involve just bringing young people uh, into pre-mapped projects developed from the top down, but ensuring that young people are involved from the beginning, that their ideas are recognized, and that they are given the opportunity to realize their own projects. This could be through education and training, or it could also be through taking the risk on youth and providing the funding for youth-led projects. I think it's also important to ensure that we do the research to find out what's working, why it's working, and how we can use what we learn to improve other projects. In this way, I think that we can work to ensure that youth are fully engaged in the sustainable development agenda and that the global goals are given the highest possible chance of being realized. Thank you, and I pass to my, well, I pass back to you. Thank you so much. So um, now we'll move on to the questions. As I said earlier, we are running a little bit high, and um, as uh, it seems like we don't have any other uh, submitted questions, uh, but we do have three. So uh, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and read out the three questions. If any of the panelists or the leads uh, want to um, give an answer or make an intervention, uh, please uh, let me know. So uh, the first question uh, that we received was uh, due to COVID-19, Many school aged children are not being taught in person, and the gap between well funded schools and underfunded schools will increase. How do you see goal four being impacted, and how can we limit the negative impacts on college education? Uh, the second question we have is youth is not a homogenous group, and issues of young people are also very diverse. In this context, how do we ensure that the most marginalized young people's concerns are addressed, especially from the leave no one behind perspective? And the last question is, how can young people better collaborate with peace actors at the national level to drive change? So if anyone would like to answer any of those questions, um, you can make your intervention. Um, this is Rosie. Hi. So I have uh, I have uh, some answers for some of the questions. The first one: uh, How we can engage diverse youth on this process? Sometimes uh, it's important to think that we need to understand also their cosmovision, also how they see the world. When we talk about indigenous youth, they have a different way to see the world. When we have when we talk about young people with disabilities or we talk about other group of young people, we need to understand how they interact and how they see the world. So we can understand what are their demands, what are their needs, and where they are coming from, because they more than no one know what they need, you know? So for this, something that we have been putting in practice in, in Peru with the Millennials Movement and with other countries in the region is that we have been partnering with organizations that work with, for instance, indigenous youth. So whenever there is a process, a consultation process to work on the implementation of the, or the follow-up of the 2030 agenda, we consult them and we also invite them to extend this invitation and to give us feedback on how to approach these young people in the indigenous communities. So perhaps we don't have the expertise with, within the team of the Millennials Movement, by, but partnering with these other organizations or groups that are actually working with these communities, we can make the processes more inclusive for them 
and more related to their to their context. For instance, we were running an online survey. What this organization that is our partner did, they recreate the online survey on a call phone. So they were calling indigenous youths and their communities, and they were answering the survey. And that's the way how they entered their words and they entered their, their, their needs. So that is a good thing, and I would invite you to also start building partnerships with other organizations and groups so we cannot we so we do not leave anyone behind and finally with uh, the goal four um my question my answer for that it's 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 real there is a huge impact due to covid 19 on on education and mostly in countries where quality education is not achieved and for instance in peru the access for the for, for internet or the digital, digital infrastructure is very low in rural communities. So mm -hmm. besides the, you know, that the poverty is being perpetuated in those areas, now that we are switching to this digital world, they don't even have the, the digital infrastructure to have access to internet. Or there are four children mm -hmm. studying through like with one single cell phone from one parent. So it's important for us first Whenever we advocate or whenever we are follow up, following up these processes, start identifying the challenges for young people and start including them on the demands or recommendations that we are making in formal or informal processes. But also is our time to take the lead. And if you see communities or young people or you know schools nearby in your community that are closing down and so on, and you are part of, an, part of an organization or you know or you have a group of friends you can support that school you know by providing i don't know like some follow up with the students supporting the local teachers and so on it's our time to stand up and also participate on this process because this COVID-19 pandemic has a, a great impact on the advance of the SDGs perhaps we might be a stepping back a little bit but now more than ever we need to engage in this process actively and creatively so that will be my my answers for two of the questions thank you thank you um we now have lynn rose lynn rose expressed that she would like to go next right um i think with my answer with the three questions first i will focus on the goal for what we are doing here in the philippines i work in a university so um we are struggling on shifting online as well and uh, what we do is engage as many stakeholders as you can in implementing because there's no one size fits all approach to um, you know opening schools and um, in the philippines where some schools are opening in august and the universities are opening in september and we've been doing the flexible learning so we're doing some um, for our students who have access online we're doing online classes for them for those who don't have access online, we're, we're doing like modular distance learning. We're sending modules through core years. And also um, some of, of, of school districts in, in the Philippines, what they're doing is that they empower youth councils to be the para teachers because it's impossible for teachers to go to 30, you know, like families and, you know, like teach parents on how to, to, to uh, implement the modules. So they, they empower young people as well. And young people are partners and in doing flexible learning might be online or the, the distance module learning type. So I think my answer is engage as many stakeholders um, as possible in, in, in your community and, um, and, and be aware that, you know, like capacity and access of students are, are, are different. So you, we got to make sure that we cater to all different um, um, groups of, of students that we have. On the second question on, on, on how we can uh, best partner or engage uh, with the young people in the national level um well young women leaders uh, for peace is um is a national network and it has amplified our voice so i think my answer to that to that is um tap on the collective voice and you know like create youth coalitions 
and uh, not in, in a national level because if if the your government will not listen to your local organization if you come together as 10 15 local organizations maybe we'll have a better chance of being listened to or being given uh, a seat on decision making uh, tables and uh, and that has also been proven that works in in the global uh, level as well and the third i think on on the question on um, youth is not homogenous I, I totally agree with that and you know, like there are cross-cutting roadblocks with with different, you know, like identity, gender, and um, uh, economic situation of young people. I think my answer to that is diverse representation. And um, with young women leaders uh, uh, for peace in the Philippines, we have di different strategies with GNWP. Like um, some empowerment comes in different phases in different communities. Empowerment may be education, maybe economic empowerment, and so on and so forth. So uh, I guess. Um, that's my answer to, to the three questions. First is engage as many uh, stakeholders. Second, uh, tap on the collective voice. And on the third is diverse representation. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Lynn Rose. And we have now Rafi. Yes, uh, thank you once again for giving me the platform. I just want to uh, uh, retrace some of the things that um, uh you know, already said um i think that one of the things that we can do in terms of collaborating or strengthening collaboration among ourselves is to, uh, number one take advantage of technology That's online sure. advocacy <laughs> online activism is the way to go and i think that we need to i mean we need to uh, leverage on it uh there's huge strength in our diversity and as as young people we need to realize this there's no need for competition what we must emphasize at, at this point is is, is is cooperation and just like amelia said we need to encourage the building of coalitions we need to encourage the formation of networks because we, we have seen with our own experience in nigeria the not too young to run movement for example was not solely an initiative of any organization it was an initiative of multi i mean uh, multi i mean uh multi-state um, entities multi-organizations coming together to, to, to push that forward and of course the question about knowledge sharing is also important we are not many youth organizations we're not on the same page i mean some are more experienced than the other some are i mean stronger than the other so we need to share experience with one another we need to train ourselves to to to, to be certain that i mean our agenda, which is the achievement of sustainable peace and development, is something that we uh, we eventually achieve. So capacity building is key, knowledge sharing is key, formation of um, coalition and networks, online advocacy and cooperation for me. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. Um, if there is no other pressing um, interventions, um, I'll go ahead and um, move on. Um, there's no, no, what's it, Esma? Esma, you'd like to, please, yes, go ahead. So I would answer, uh, I would say first and second question. So one was about the, the access to internet, to devices and to education online. Um, it's very important uh, to, to uh, be very flexible and also to ensure for, this, for the state that the platform that they will use for online learning is uh, accessible for everyone, including people with disabilities, that it's, uh, let's say, blind friendly and uh, deaf friendly and all other uh, disabilities considering. Um, there is also a good practice from Estonia where they have a technology education specialist in every in, in some schools at least and to have that would be good to have uh, one in each and every school to um, address teachers questions and teach them how to use technology properly and finally there are for example in georgia we have this initiative it's called turnon.ge where people contribute uh, some money or they can contribute devices and they give away um, some laptops some smartphones to those who don't have them, but also mostly what they do, they would pay for your internet expenses if you are uh, socially vulnerable and if you don't have uh, good internet access, uh, because this is this is very very crucial. Um, I know some teachers and some schools um, using even Facebook messengers to uh, to share the educational materials somehow and then to, to pass exams and to discuss with the teacher. So um, I would say flexibility is a key here. 
and on the uh, engaging most vulnerable groups, um, I would say that the UN Youth Delegates uh, could be a good resource in, in that respect because they are peers and they could speak with the um, with their young peers about their needs and then voice them uh, with the decision makers and all around different platforms. But it's also very important to establish a platform of direct dialogue between uh, high level officials, for instance, parliamentarians, uh, members of the government, ministers, uh, with the young people uh, where, where they could directly ask questions and uh, or make some comments and propose some initiatives. Um, so I would say that's, that's it on my side. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so we'll go ahead and uh, wrap up um, unless there's another pressing uh, intervention. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, I, it's gonna be impossible to actually sum up all of the rich content um, that every one of you have just presented. But I, you know, um, the takeaway is a lot of times we say youth is apathetic. You know, that's why they don't participate. But I think the real problem is, uh, but you know, just from listening, to all of you, youth isn't. That's a very small statement. Youth is very active, um, very curious, um, and take action. But I think the real problem is maybe we are not uh, providing that space for participation, uh, for we're not providing enough quality education, uh, the resources, the protection for you to actually take uh, effective um, participation in these processes. So like um, what uh, one of the uh, leads has said, um, I think it's now time that governments stop using youth as instruments, but actually start thinking of putting them in the process um, side by side and to work with them together, uh, not just merely kind of treating them like an audience. So thank you so much. Um, I think that was a very rich uh, uh, discussion and I definitely learned a lot and have been empowered to work when provide more space to you um, from where I am in Asia. So um, thank you for joining us today. And I think uh, lastly, uh, we have the uh, opportunity uh, of hearing um, the closing remarks from the Secretary General of the Community of Democracies, uh, Thomas Garrett. Uh, please, uh, thank you for uh, joining us and I'll give you the floor to you. Well, let me uh, start by thanking Ambassador Michalescu for her very encouraging words of support uh, and inspiration. And I also want to thank you, Sue, for moderating today's very interesting discussion. You took us from Asia to the Caucasus, from Nigeria and Gambia to Romania, from Poland to Peru, and many points in between. And I think we had a truly global experience. And thank you again for facilitating that. When he opened the forum in yesterday's first session, Foreign Minister Orescu said that democracy is never a finished process, but it requires each generation to further develop and enrich its values and principles. And I think with those words, he established the priority for his country as a community of democracy's presidency is youth empowerment and youth inclusion. And the great ideas, the innovative concepts we've heard from the speakers and the COD youth leads yesterday and today tell me that young people are already active in that process in their own countries and globally. So as young people spoke yesterday and today, one of the things I heard were differences of opinion and I heard differences of approach. And I think that's a very good thing in democracy. We should be glad for that. But I also heard many more things which seem to unite all of us, all of the young people. For example, most all of you spoke about the problem of corruption as a key issue for young people and for your future. And almost all of you spoke about education being needed to equip and to empower young people. Of course, transparency, accountability, and equal access to education are very much among the 19 principles of the Warsaw Declaration. 
the 20th anniversary of which we celebrated just this past month. It was back in 2000 that nations from every corner of the world came to Poland for a gathering that was called Towards a Community of Democracies. Those countries uh, represented the diversity that exists in democracy and their proof that each country is then and now at a different place on its path to democracy. The logo of the Community of Democracies, which you can, I believe, see behind me now, shows various shades of blue, and that is meant to represent the diversity that exists in our world among the world's many democracies. But at the same time, will we acknowledge diversity? Uh, back in 2000, uh, those that gathered knew that there were certain principles, very specific values of human rights that had to be present if a system wanted to call itself a democracy. And so 106 of those countries, which met 20 years ago, brought those principles and universal values together and created the Warsaw Declaration on Democracy. The same process really occurred uh, over the last couple of weeks with the Youth Forum Statement, which is now online for you to add your name and country to if you choose. And not each of the youth leads agreed to every item contained in the Youth Forum Statement. Just as in the Warsaw Declaration process 20 years ago, there were differences of opinion and diversity, but on the big principles, there was agreement on the universal hopes and ideas that unite our youth leads from 17 different countries. In your remarks and interventions for this youth forum yesterday and today, it's clear that the Warsaw Declaration is relevant to a new generation 20 years later. Yesterday's session number one looked at the role young people play in civil society and in elected office. Today's session confirmed that given opportunities and resources, young people are the hope for implementation, monitoring and review of the UN 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. Young people have the numbers. There are more young people on earth than at any time in history. Young people have the numbers to ensure the success of the 2030 Agenda and with it, for your futures, global sustainability and stability. You know, those challenges that have plagued generations before you, unemployment, poverty, gender inequality, a lack of access to quality education, and conflict, I am sure are going to find an answer in your ideas and in your action. I really want to welcome the decision this past week by the UN Security Council to acknowledge the role of youth in preventing and resolving conflict, as well as in building and maintaining peace. UN Security Council Resolution 2535 encourages the member states of the United Nations to include young people in decision-making processes, and it calls for the protection of youth in civic spaces, all issues that you brought up today and yesterday. And the goal of UNS Security Council Resolution 2535 is to increase the inclusive representation of youth for the prevention and the resolution of conflicts. Some of you talked about coming out of families and, and uh, situations of conflict. Some of you talked about the conflict that is still present, all too present in your life today. At the Community of Democracies, at the United Nations Security Council, in your countries, in your cities and towns, young people now are acknowledged as the upcoming generation of policymakers. But we also know that today you're an effective agent of change for democratic systems. And so at the Community of Democracies, we look forward to this forum as a beginning to hearing your ideas in the days, months, and years ahead. So again, I want to thank all of you for your participation. And as we close, I just want to say to you, stay healthy, stay united, and keep speaking. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you so much for that. Thank you everyone um, for participating. I think this is the official close. Hopefully we'll get to meet everyone in person next year. As the Secretary General said, please stay healthy and stay safe. Goodbye. Thank you, bye-bye. All right, bye.
Bye. <laughs>